Hello everyone, it's Kahul. I just returned from my late night screening of Dune Part 2. I got the souvenir metallic popcorn bucket and the souvenir Dune cup, Dune soda cup with straw and lid included. Ooh. Um, my review of the popcorn bucket, because it's metal, when it came out, they like keep them in like a heated, like a heat lamp. They keep them under a heat lamp. So when you, I went to get the popcorn bucket, it was hot. It like, hurt my hand. It was like, they kept like hot metal under like the, in, like, the heat case. And it's like, why would they do that? Why? I don't get it. And they had the plastic buckets in there too. I'm thinking all oh, those plastic buckets are going to get all melty then. I'm sure they're rated for a certain heat thing, but whatever. Other theater going review experiences before going into the review of the movie itself. Um, the theater I went to was like a big, it was the big dick big screen at my local theater. And it was good. The, the, the sound and the visuals were all nice, but um, there, was like a, there was like a spot on the screen. There was a couple like wrinkles and like there was like a little like, I don't know if it was a tear or like a hole. And it was kind of noticeable in some of the scenes. There's a lot of like, like, pale white scenes of the desert it's really obvious you can see like where like the marks are on the screen so that was a bit obnoxious considering i paid more money to go see it there i was like maybe it would have been better in the smaller screen because i wouldn't have seen that but let's talk about dune part two because it's probably the mo movie i was looking forward to most last year um and i guess by proxy this year i don't even know what else is coming out this year i think there's a I, I suppose preview for this year first. I think like movies that would be good this year. It's this, the Godzilla X Kong. There's that Adam Sandler movie where he's in space and he befriends like a space spider. That movie looks fucking good. That movie looks fucking sweet. You can't deny that Spaceman movie with Adam Sandler. The trailers for it look good and they look like really interesting, and like the concept's super unique and fun. Um, and Adam Sandler seems to be doing a pretty good performance, and it, it's just a I know, like, a guy trapped in space isn't that unique, but, like, him meeting a space spider, it's just a giant spider who talks to him. Interesting concept for a movie. Excited for that. Um, I don't know anything else that's coming out this year that looks, like, good, though. So this is, like, this is, like, the movie. Dune Part 2 was the movie for this year. It was the one. You know? And, uh, I'm gonna give you my general review of it. It is somewhat disappointing, but understandable that they're... This movie also ends on a cliffhanger, I'll say that, because it leads into Dune Messiah, which I believe is what happens in the book as well. Um, but it really ends on a cliffhanger, this one. Like, there's like not a lot of there's a lot of like open endings, there's like not like there's a lot of character resolutions left unfulfilled. Um, so I hope that the filming with Dune Messiah go as well and they actually make Dune Messiah. Because if they don't, this will fucking feel really embarrassing. Um to end it like this. I guess it's just the nature of adapting this book, though. Because Dune is a... Sen Dune Messiah was originally, I think, intended to be part of Dune. But from whatever publishing reasons, he des they decided to publish it separately. And Dune Messiah is much shorter. It's like a, almost like a little... You know, if you look at the book, it's, it's supposed to, like, go with... It's supposed to be, like, the third... It's the third act of Dune, right? It's like the third... It's part three of Dune. Um, and then... Children of Dune, all the rest are actual sequels that are new stories, but, um, a review of Dune Part 2, uh, I've heard complaints about the choices for the actors, um, I think across the board, they were pretty okay, I think they, the choices they made were mostly okay in terms of who they chose to be the actors, um, there's a couple people who I didn't know were in this, gonna be in this movie that were kind of surprising. One was Leah Cito. Um, she's that girl who's in Death Stranding, I guess. I don't really know her for much else, but um, she was quite good in this movie. She was good. Uh, I think that was the only one. I, I, I was surprised she was in this. Um, there are complaints online that a couple of the more dramatic, important lines from the book were cut. Specifically the one about uh, Paul telling the, the Bene Gesserit mother to like look into the darkness of herself and you will find him uh that was not in the movie so there were some things that were changed but i think overall this was a very good movie it was well adapted i was i was disappointed when he first one of the best scenes of the original david lynch dune is when 
uh, Paul first, you know, when he first rides the big sandworm. And I think that scene still is better in the original. I don't think, I think the music, I think the soundtrack in general is better than the original David Lynch movie. Uh, there's a lot of things that are, uh, you could do an interesting comparison because the David Lynch movie is not a good movie. David Lynch admits it's a not good movie. It's not a good movie because it is poorly written and edited and like paced. It is just, it is trying to condense the, uh, this is, this book is big enough that even they are blitzing through scenes in this movie. It is so fast paced and it's not dwelling. You know, people look at the runtime and think it also be some of this plotting thing. They are blitzing through and only, they're just only barely able to have a little bit of breathing room for the characters. There's no like long drawn out scenes where nothing's happening. It is just, it's all fucking meat. You know, there's no filler, there's no fat on this steak. You know, it's just a giant steak, you know, uh, with like very little fat. I mean, there has to be some to let some breathing happen to make the movie work, you know, to make the story actually feel like a real story instead of a blitzkrieg of exposition, which is what the David Lynch movie is essentially. It's a blitzkrieg of exposition and then like weird esoteric scenes where stuff happens and you still don't understand what's happening in the story. This movie, you do get what's happening in the story. And I mean, the interest, I mean, the whole conflict of the prophecy and him seeing, um, not wanting to fulfill the prophecy, which again, it's not really a prophecy. Him being the Messiah, it's not like he's like a real, like, religious prophecy. It is a calculated, created, mathematically designed event that is that has transpired to create and been happened, right? Which is a difference. There's a big difference between um, that. I think before I watched this movie, I watched a bit of Doug Walker's review, and he was complaining a little bit about, you know, he was talking about how this is like the traditional, oh, you chosen one storyline. Oh, you know, it's, it's, you, you start watching, it's this typical chosen one storyline. And nowhere in this movie is a typical chosen one storyline. Okay? He is a messiah. But he, like, the whole point of the fucking story, the whole, like, underlying, like, through the main plot, there's the political, there's the world building, the dialogue, and, like, the political back and forth, and, like, the, you know, the, the science of the world, and the spice, and all this, but the main storyline is not a chosen one storyline, it is a, these psychic women, the Ben and Genesis, have created the idea of a chosen one in these people, and are, like, have, like, civilizationally engineered this situation to come about to c further create their process of creating this grand vision they have for the future. It's, like, it, it's not a chosen one. They have... It's an engineered situation. And it's Paul struggling with having to decide, should I fall this situation that's been engineered perfectly for me to arise? But if I do this, how will it... It could destroy... I, I, it's Paul finding his way in a world that was engineered to kind of, like try and control him, and him exerting control over it, you know, and becoming the Quitsa Tadarik, which, I, I don't know how Doug gets it, I guess he just, like, hears the word Chosen One, and I think it's, oh, it's the Chosen One storyline, but it's not, it, it's literally, it is the subversion of that, it is, like, the opposite of that, it is not, this man, oh, he will fulfill the prophecy and save our people, no, no, they think he is that, because these people told him that that is who he is, and he doesn't want to know, isn't sure if he should actually go through with it and film, because he can, if he wants to, he can decide to do it at any time, but he rejects that idea because he's afraid of the consequences of it, and he's afraid of the death it which will ensue, which I believe it will ensue, which will, it will happen based on the books. Um, I just don't understand how Doug didn't get that, because it's pretty fucking clearly explained out in the movie, and that's the thing, this movie is easy to understand. You know what's happening in this very complex story, that a lot of people, it's a very esoteric, Dune is a very esoteric, weird fucking story about guys turning into giant space worms to fulfill their prophecies of the future, you know, and this movie makes, gets you that story and delivers it to you in a way that's easy to understand. And it does it in a beautiful, I mean, the visuals are amazing, um, the soundtrack is not, the thing is the visuals are amazing, and breathtaking, and they're very visually distinct, and it's very clearly this guy's vision of how he thinks Dune should look. I still prefer the vision, visually, of the David Lynch film, and even, you look at some of Yodorowsky's Dune's concept sketches with H.R. Uh, Geiger did, I think both of those are more interesting Dune visions, visually. So this is probably the least interesting vision of Dune visually, but it's the best realized visual vision, right? 
Although, I will say the soundtrack, um, it, it did get a little bit grainy for me in this movie, because it's very, it's, the, all the songs are pretty similar. It's like, hey, 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 and it's like these, like, fucking low droning, uh, you know, what's his face? Christopher Nolan uses them all the time. Um, Christopher Nolan didn't use them in his latest movie, by the way, which I think helped. It's uh, Hans Zimmer. Hans Zimmer, it, it sounds like a Hans Zimmer soundtrack. I'm not even sure if it, it might actually have been Hans Zimmer. Uh, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, but... You know, Christopher Nolan, it, it sounds like a Hans Zimmer soundtrack, and it's like, I'm very sick of the Hans Zimmer soundtrack. I know it's been, like, the modern, it's been, like, the, the sound, the sonic design of modern Hollywood for the last, like, decade and a half, it feels like. And I think I'm done with it. I'm ready for regular orchestral songs to be back. I'm ready for new des sound designs. Um, I suppose it kind of matches, the thing is, I don't even think it matches the visual style of this movie. The visual style is so very dry and 70s looking. And I would have preferred if it was, there was different songs to go with it. I think when Paul first rides the Sandworm, it should be like the, the the guitar riff that happens in the original Doom movie. There's no moment in either this movie or the first part that is as good as the moment when Paul, you know, he's caught the big one, and then it's like do 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 the fucking like huge or catch like the fucking electric guitar riff and like the fucking lightning in the sky and the you can see the full Sandworm puppet. And it looks awesome. And there's no moment as good as that in this movie. And the reason I bring that up is that when he first catches and rides the grand worm, you don't see it. You don't see the worm. You don't see the fucking front of the worm. You just see him moving through the sand, which is a really interesting choice. Um, it's very intense and very, like, gritty. Um, but I was really disappointed because it's like, I want the payoff of seeing the worm. Like, you can see, like, you see him struggling and he's doing it. Um... I want to see the big payoff where, like, you see the worm, and it's cool, and it's awesome, and you don't. Like, you see the side worm, you see a bit of, like, him destroying the dudes, but you don't see the worm head on, it's all blurry, and it's like, you can't see it. But, and for most of the movie, you actually don't see the worms head on, which is weird, because you could see the worm in the last movie, but there's, they save it for the big payoff in the final battle. The final battle, they, the um, Emperor's, uh, oh God, I forget the name of them, but the Emperor's Swords guys who were like his guard they're on the fucking planet and he like fucking blows up this mountain with these nukes and then boom the the worms come out and you finally see the worms there fucking leading this final attack and it is a sweet moment that's a really awesome moment and it's probably the best moment in the whole film and visually and you know emotionally it's just, it's a real climax it's kind of amazing um and i mean the main thing, though, is that you get the story. The story is there, and the underlying story is so good, you kind of... It, it, and it comes across in a way that's very good. This movie is carried by a couple of actors. Um, Benicio Del Toro is amazing in this. I think he is his... his, his he's really stand out. As one, he's a great choice. I wish the other Fremen Wars goes, I don't like Zendai. I didn't hate Zendai as much as I thought I would have. Um... I don't really buy the chemistry between her and Timothy Chalamet. He doesn't come off as real. I feel like he cares about her. I, I can definitely get that, but I don't feel like she cares about him. I don't get the I don't feel love between them. I, it feels very one sided. Um, the Paul's mom, who I don't know the name of that actress, but she's amazing. She was the best part of the first movie, and she's great in this movie too. Um. One of the things that happens throughout the whole movie is you see Paul's sister in the womb. And she doesn't she isn't born in this movie. She's still uh in the womb at the end of this movie. And like you can see like her like starting out from an embryo and turning into like, a little baby, and then when she, his mom drinks the water of life, you can see like the water of life like flowing through and like going through the baby. She's played by Anya Taylor Joy. You do see her in the future in this, but she's not actually in the movie. Like, she is, Anya Taylor-Joy is in the movie, but only in, like, forward vision, right? Because Paul can see the future. Her character is not, a, her as a, she she is not born in this film. Whereas I believe she's born in by the end of the first book. Um, so, who fucking knows? Um, Christopher Walken is great as the Emperor. He's almost a little bit too goofy, he just is Chris. It's just Christopher Walken. I don't see the Emperor. It is just Christopher Walken. But it's kind of. I, I love Christopher Walken, so I don't mind. Uh, he's great in it. Florence Pugh is like okay as the Emperor's daughter, but I don't really feel like we get to know anything about her character. At all. It's just like she comes in and talks about stuff. She's like the 
background with the, the the B plot. There's like a bunch of side plots to go through. I thought Austin Butler was really good as the um, Harkonnen dude. I think it's, it's a really good contrast between him and Dave Bautista. I think Dave Bautista's uh, shot is like the hidden like one of the best actors in this movie. I don't know. He's a fucking great actor. Really coming to his own. He's got a lot of range. He does a lot of like. He, obviously, he's a big muscle guy. He's a big muscle guy in all the movies he's in, technically, but he has a ton of range. Like, he can do so many different things and so many different emotions. And he, he comes off so cowardly in this movie, right? He is a coward, and he dies. He does die an honorable death, though, honestly, which is kind of interesting. He dies in, in combat. But, um... It's... I think if you know the story of the books, which I've read most... A good chunk of the first Dune book... I'm, I have I struggle with reading, man. I'm I'm not good at reading. I I've really struggled the last. God, it's been. I'm 27 now. I think it's been almost 10 years since I fully like read a book. It was it's before high school? It was during high school. No, because I graduated when I was 17. Shit, it's been 10 years. Well, yeah, in, in like August, in the summer of this year, I think that was I think in school was the last time I read a book fully cover to cover. Um, and at the end of high school, and I haven't read a full book since then. Um, so, but I want to finish Dune. That's going to be my first book back, and I'm going to start reading again. Um, I'm not going to do audiobooks. I feel like audiobooks is cheating, although I think it's a really good Dune audiobook. But, as someone who is, uh, really wants to read the books, and has read a good chunk, I've read, like, uh, about, like, halfway through the first book now. Someone who's read halfway through the first book and really appreciates what it's trying to do, um... I can't speak to everything about what is and isn't missing from the story. So I can only judge this movie on the merits of what it's presenting. And I do get the faint grasp. You get that thing when you watch any book adaptation, that you're watching like a hollow version of a better story. Um, sometimes it's not the case. Sometimes the movie really does surpass the books. Um, I'm thinking specifically like The Shining and a couple other movie adaptations of books where the movie really either it surpasses the book or really adds to the book, like really like makes the book better because it helps like bring a visual identity to the story, you know. Um, or it takes kind of a mediocre work and turns into kind of a great thing. Side note: I'm, I'm I watched the first two How to Train Your Dragon movies. I don't know why I think they were just on. I think I just saw one. I was like, oh fuck it, I'll watch it. Sometimes I just watch it because I'm I'm a degenerate. Um, but I, I watched those two movies. Um, sh those movies are fucking really well animated. They got great soundtracks too. Fucking great scores in those movies. I wish this. I wish Dune was scored by the people who did How to Train Your Dragon because they would have done a way better job with the music in this shit. Because that's the one thing. It just the visuals are very distinct, and I get it. It's not like really my preference. I prefer the old dude, but it's so cohesive. I I still love it. They're still beautiful. Um, and I really appreciate. That, that there is an artistic vision for this. And it doesn't feel... It feels unique, and it feels fully realized. Um, oh, my God. The scenes when they're on the Harkonnen planet with the black sun. Oh, my God, that's so cool. And they had the fireworks going off into these, like, little, like, ink splot explosions in the sky. Oh, that was so cool. Wow, that was so good. That was amazing. I think that's one of the best... Um, some of the best sci-fi visuals I've seen in a, in a movie in a long, long time. The transitions between black and white and color are so seamless. Um, wow. Really great. Really awesome. And uh, the visuals are, are stunning, as I've said, but I think the real thing holding this movie... And the acting is all good to... It's At, at worst, it's, it's good. At best, it's really great. Um, I think overall, though, it's, it's, a, it's a, I would say it's, it's a pretty good, pretty good acting across the board. Um, obviously, great direction, and the script is very well done. Um, and there's some really great standout performances. I think the mother, um, Austin Butler, I think is a standout. He's really great in this. Um, uh, Josh Brolin as Gurney is good, really great. Uh, I think Timothy Chalamet did a great, a, a really good job too. You really feel for him. I still don't see him as intimidating as a physical presence at the end. You know, he's supposed to be like this, like main, like bad guy, but he still comes off so small. His presence is so physically small; it's hard for me to take him seriously. You know, like I, I don't, I, like it worked well when he was the child, but 
now he should be an adult, you know? That's a good thing. It's not even been nine months since this all happened. He didn't grow up. He's not an adult. That's really weird. He should be a... a I guess that's maybe, that must be why, I guess. But, like, you know, this all took place in the span of a pregnancy. You know, the pregnancy hasn't even ended, right? And all this is happening. And I think originally in the book, it's like a multi-year long war effort, right? And I think... Uh, That's really interesting that I just realized that. That that's kind of stupid. That's really fucking... That was a stupid decision, I think. You know? I mean, I get it, but, like, because they want to, like, save the birth for the next movie, but... I don't know, man. They should have aged Paul up a little bit, made him get older. <coughs> um, but, you know, that's... I, was, I, I think that's a big negative, actually. Now that I've just th thought that out... I think that that was a change that was overall for the worse, and it was a big negative, and I wouldn't have done it myself. Um, so that was a neg. I think that's overall not great. I think, uh, but the biggest con of this movie, the, the soundtrack, it's not there. The soundtrack is just not there, and it's something that's a problem with all modern movies. It's not just this movie. Um, movie sound, there hasn't been a great iconic movie soundtrack in a long time i can't think of the last time a movie i mean like hell it may be how to train your dragon that i just watched like that cause has a really like amazing soundtrack that i can still like recall in my head when i think when i think about that movie i think about those songs right and i'm struggling to think of a movie that's had as good of a uh, iconic, I think it's been at least since the 2010s, right? We've been in a decade-long slump. There's some movies, like, 2000s movies that have, like, really amazing scores that you think it's, like, but, like, I think it's, like, I think I first started to notice it with the Star Wars sequel movies, which have really bad soundtracks, which is weird. It's, oh, it's John Williams' classic soundtrack. Um, but they're worse. They're, like, performed worse. They have less impact. They feel more hollow. Um, something about them just feels weird and wrong and out of place in those movies, and, oh, there's been a lot of, like, move towards, like, lo-fi and, like, more ambient soundtracks in movies, which I think it's a mistake. I don't think that's necessarily the, it's, it's the right fit for some movies, but it's not the right fit for every movie, but I feel like composers in Hollywood, we've been really lacking great soundtracks. Um, maybe someone else can attest to this or agree with me, but, it's not just that the songs have to be great, because there's great compositions in a lot of movies, but they're not iconic. They don't, like, establish a, a, a sonic identity for the film, if that makes sense. They don't establish, like, when I think of this movie, here's the sounds I think of. When I think of Dune, I think... When I think of Dune Part 1, actually, I think of the guy going... The fucking throat singing guy. Like, that guy was fucking awesome. And he was, like, the best part of that One of the best parts of the first movie was, like, hearing him going... And it's like, where's that? And so we just get these weird, like, tribal chantings and stuff. And I, I guess that's kind of the identity of this movie, but it was less so. And I I think story-wise, I think I said this already, but the plot, the pacing was very fast. You know, this movie was fucking two, something like almost three hours long. It was like two hours and 45 minutes. I went to the movie at 10.30. I didn't get back home. I think we left the theater like one thirty, so and that's almost a three-hour movie, dude. I mean, some of it was previewed still, but man, it's a th almost a three-hour movie. It didn't feel it. I almost felt like when it was finally time to end, when it was finally ending, I was like, oh god, it's ending already? No, because it ends on a really weird note. It ends on like Chani going out to ride the sandworm again, and it's like, uh, that's what it ends on, you know? It's like that's like. The ending is this. The end. Here's how. If, compared to the, I'm not sure where the, how the first book ends, but here's the ending of this movie. The movie ends with Paul uh, defeats uh, Austin Butler's uh, character, who's Duke something Harkonnen. He's like the all Duke. He's like the the heir, the, the next Duke. He's like it's, it's a, the next to the line Duke of uh, Harkonnen or Baron, not Duke. Uh, the next to the Lion Baron, the other, the second, the youngest Harkonnen, and he defeats him in combat, and then he, like, gets, he's, like, 
like taken the emperor's daughter as his wife and made the emperor bend the knee and kiss the ring, right? And then immediately after that, they got, they announced that the 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 houses the who their fleet whose fleets are on uh, uh, Dune who are at Arrakis. He's, they say, well, we don't honor, we don't recognize you, you're sent to, we don't recognize you as the next emperor. So then they all have to go up in their ships and go to war with the fleet, and then the movie just ends, and then we see, Ch and then Charlie's mad because he's marrying the emperor's daughter, and then she goes in, he calls a sandworm, and that's it, that's how the movie ends, and it's like, it was a close up on her face, and it's like, uh, that's it, that's, like, that's the ending, the ending was kind of weak. I don't know, I don't, I didn't like the ending, I thought the actual ending shot was... It, it, it focused. The thing is, Chani, I guess, is an important character, but she's not as important as Paul. The, the focus is on Paul. He's the main character. It should have ended on him. I think ending on her was a big mistake and uh, kind of a fuck up. But whatever. You gotta get the. You gotta sell those popcorn buckets. You gotta ride the beast. This has been a long review. 26 minutes, Jesus. A lot to say. It's a big, long movie. Sorry, this has been kind of rambling, but um, I think it's a... I think it, if a movie makes you care this much and talk this long, it probably has some quality to it. That's what I'll say. Even if it's good or bad quality, I think I would recommend go see this in the theaters. Um, preferably if you can see it in a big screen format or an IMAX, it all costs extra, but this is one of those times where it's like the visuals and the sound, the, the music, the visuals and the sound effect. I will say this, while the, the soundtrack's not great, the sound effects, the actual, like, sound design, top notch. It feels, it's so good. All of the sound effects are crisp, they sound great, it feels so good. Uh, it's just really nice to be in a really high quality sci-fi. It's great to go see a high quality sci-fi movie that has a story that is good and characters that are compelling and tells an interesting story and has, like, got a... I don't know, because, like, after so many, like, years of Star Wars and Star Trek just delivering absolute slop shit to the masses, it's hard to, like, not recognize that things are bad when it comes to science fiction. Science fiction films are either weird like, niche, esoteric, like, small-scale productions. Like, I think a good comparison would be Ascension, which is another thing that Villeneuve did. I think it's Ascension. Con I forget what it was with the big... With Amy, whatever her face, with the big alien ships, so the big things. It's not Ascension. Is it Ascension? It might be Ascension. Whatever, you know the movie I'm talking about. Fucking look it up, dumbass. Um, I'm stupid. And I don't, I can't look it up because I'm on my phone recording it, this video right now, so I can't actually look it up. So I'm just gonna assume it's Ascension, but but like that movie's got an interesting premise, and that was like I thought I really liked that movie a lot, especially with the way it plays with time and contact, and I thought the way it plays with the, the film as a medium was interesting. But that movie's very small scale. It feels like I mean, even though there's like great visual effects and there's got big actors in it and all that. The story is not a grand epic story. It's a simple, like, contained story about the first contact of aliens on this on Earth. It's very simple to the point. And it's very nice to see a high-quality space epic. That's, like, an epic science fiction fucking story that has a science fiction, or even a fantasy story at this point, right? Well, that, that takes place, like, I mean, since, like, the Hobbit movies, right? We haven't had a, a, a great, large-scale science fiction or fantasy movie that's of this high quality, right? Even before the high movies, I mean, like, 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 since, like, because like, this used to be something that you could go see, the go to a movie and see something this cool, right? But movies haven't been like this. They've even been, either been super low budget, small indie flicks or small scale, like, double A, you know, basic movies that aren't, they don't have the scope and the budget to do something cool. Right, they're either that, or they're dumb. They're big and dumb. <clears throat> they're either small and smart, or they're big and dumb. And it's nice to see a large scale smart movie, because I mean the amount of actors and visual effects and and stories going on in the great grand epic scale of like this like battle for control of the Imperium of the future. You know that's such a crazy 
that's an epic scale story, right? It's not a small story. It's a large scale epic story that still has great characters, smart dialogue, smart writing, um, good act, good quality act. Even the bad actors in this movie act well. Does that make sense? Because like fucking Zendaya is in this movie, Austin Butler's in this movie. There's tons of people in this movie who should suck because they're bad actors, but they're being directed by a great director. So their performances, they don't bother me because they're being directed in a way that's good. You know, they're, they've, they've been given the crutch. And yeah, it, it, frankly, one of the things that is, it is distracting that like almost all the main actors are like just the flavor of the year actors. It's like Florence Pugh is in this, uh, Anya Taylor-Joy is in this. It's all like the, like the currently popular actors, like the current crop of Hollywood's like groupies. And that's kind of cringe and lame, but their performances are all great for the most part. Um... At worst, they're good, and they're. It, that's. I think that's down to the direction more than anything. But it is refreshing and nice to see a movie that feels like a real movie, it's telling a real great story that's science fiction. Because like you can see great movies that are you know set in like just like regular like you know crime thrillers or whatever, but it's hard to get a really good science fiction movie out because Disney or you know, stupid people, fucking stupid people run movie industries, right? It's hard to get a smart movie made. Even, like, Blade Runner 2049, um, people love, a lot of people like that movie, and there are parts of that movie that I like, but that movie has the stupidest fucking script of all time. It's so schizophrenically edited and scripted. It's a movie that's been chopped up and destroyed by a studio. I want a director's cut of that movie that, like, fixes it, because as it is, it's a fucking, that movie just got fucking ass raped by the studio i'm not sure who it was but some editor whoever edited it whoever put the sequences in order right it's a movie that has like some incredible themes and like moments but it's also bogged down in like the stupidity that made like the star wars sequels bad and i'm not wrong about that like the shoehorning of harrison ford into it um the like overall narrative of it is incoherent and stupid uh, fucking dumb actors being in it who don't deserve to be in there. But, you know, I mean, the, the, the crux of, like, you know, the android with his AI girlfriend. <coughs> that's such an iconic fucking great story that it overrides. It, it, it rises above the rest of that trash heap of a movie. But, hey, that's okay. But, like, that's, like, the last, like, great... That's been, like, the last big sci-fi movie. And it wasn't that good. And this is way better the Dune movies are way better than Blade Runner 2049. Way fucking better. Because they actually have a good fucking story. <laughs> you know? But it, it was fucking epic when he... It was epic. It wasn't as basic as it was in the book, but it was epic when he just shouted down the Reverend Mother and said, Shut the... F shut... Silence! Silence, woman! Boom! <laughs> this scheming woman who's like... Kill, who's like plotted to kill his whole family he just shouts her the fuck down. Like, sit down, bitch. Thank God. Um, review out of 10, I'm going to give it a, like a 8 out of 10. I don't know. If fucking, well, we have 5 stars. Uh, I'll give it 3 stars. That's a, that would be a 6? 4 star. 4 star movie. It's a 4 star movie. 4 out of 5 stars, not 3. I think it's a great movie. But it could have been better, and I thought the ending was a little disappointing. And I guess we'll see. We'll, I'll give it to Dune Messiah. I'll give it one more. I really enjoyed my time with it. I don't know if I enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed part one, which is weird because there's more action, there's more bombastic moments, and the story is more climactic in this one. But I don't think I liked it as much because I like what was most fun about these movies is learning about the world, like learning about the lore and learning about the set setting is to me the most fun part and it kind of unraveling the narrative. Right, that's the most fun part of the of these movie of of the story for me. Um, so I guess if I read the book, it wouldn't have been as fun. Um, and maybe on rewatches, I won't like it as much. I remember rewatching the first Dune. I rewatched it on a computer monitor, which sucked. I, I'm never gonna watch these movies on a computer monitor. They just suck. It's comp I think I watched like streaming on like my PC or something, and it's like that was a terrible way to watch it over my web browser. That was a terrible way to fucking watch it. I'm gonna watch it on my. I'll watch it on my big TV on a Blu-ray or like a fucking 4K stream, maybe, but never, 
Never again over fucking like basic fucking streaming stuff. I'm not gonna do that. Um, I uh, I think that this is a it's a high quality movie made by a very high quality director. Villeneuve is a, is a one of the best working directors in Hollywood today. He's a great director. Um, made some of my favorite movies of the of the twenty two thousands and twenty tens. Um, and I look forward to Dune Messiah because they're doing Dune Messiah. I heard, which makes sense because the ending of this movie is also a fucking cliffhanger. It's a bit disappointing. This also ends on a cliffhanger. I wonder if they'll call it Dune Messiah or if they'll call it Dune Part Three. We'll see. Hopefully, they just call it Dune Messiah. But uh, they could be. They could call it Dune Part Three, dude. I'm not joking. They may do it that way. The, he said he's no plans to do Children of Dune or God Emperor of Dune or whatever. That's a huge mistake. We definitely need people in Hollywood to sit down and approve the script for God Emperor of Dune because that would be so funny. It would be so fucking funny to see what happens to God Emperor of Dune to make like like because like my mom was asking me if I should if she should go see this movie and she's like, well, it's so long. I'm like, well, if you don't, if it's too long for you, don't go fucking see it, you know. And she's not a big sci-fi person, anyways. Like. But she, like, wants to go see good movies. She's... The thing is, my parents like going out to see movies. And they've been so deprived these last... Man, you don't know how bad it is. It's like... They're, like, coming to me like, Patrick, please, give us something good to watch. And I'm like... I know what they like. And I don't think they like Dune because they don't like long sci-fi movies. I, I love sci-fi stuff. I mean, they just have different tastes than me. But... But like they're considering going to see Dune, which is a movie they they know they probably won't like, but they know it's of good. They know it's a good quality movie, and they're that desperate because it's like, man, there's nothing. These there used to be so many quality like mid budget little films that would come out that would make good money, not amazing, but like you know like smaller like rom coms or like fun like not even rom coms but like just like basic comedies or slice of life style movies or you know, cool dramas or, like, thrillers, you know, that were produced kind of, that, like, had, like, a couple quality actors, but were just, like, good movies. You go to the theater and say, oh, that seems like a good movie. Good movie. We'll go watch that. That's gone. You're either getting the big spectacle or the cheap shit. That's all that's left in Hollywood. And you know what? Sometimes I don't want either of those. I usually don't ever want to watch cheap shit movies. Right, I mean, I'll watch an uh, occasional horror movie, but I, I really don't like cheap, shitty horror movies. I'm not a big... I know everyone online who's a film critic has to, like, love... Oh, man, I love low-budget, like, so bad it's good horror movies. <laughs> I don't. I don't like so bad it's good horror movies, dude. I don't fucking like that. I like good movies. I like movies that entertain me and make me happy. Not some cheap shit that, like, oh, but you got the cool gore, and, oh, like, so weird, and, ah, it's like Halloween, ah, I don't care. I don't like Halloween. I don't like the Halloween movies. I think the first Halloween movie, I think the best Halloween movie is Halloween 3, and the second best is the Rob Zombie Halloween. And all the other Halloween movies are shit. They're not good. They're fucking bad. I watched them all. I watched them all. They're all fucking shit. Rob Zombie, want Hall the, the Halloween, Season of the Witch is a good movie. The Halloween, the Rob Zombie Halloween isn't even a good movie, but it's better than any of the fucking other ones. That first John Carpenter Halloween movie, I guess it's for its time, whatever. Fuck you. I think, I think fucking Black Christmas came out before that. Black Christmas is so much better than the first Halloween movie. Okay? All these fucking, they're just dog shit trash, man. I, I want to do a rant. I have to save that rant for another day. The Halloween film franchise rant is coming. Um, also, I gotta watch How to Train Your Dragon 3, and I'll do a How to Train Your Dragon series review, um, cause I actually, I, I have some stuff to say about that, but leave a comment down below what movie you want me to review next, and I'll review it, um, cause I got nothing else to do, cause I'm done being late internet weirdo who gets involved in drama, I only do movie reviews now, there's no more internet drama, <clears throat> no more internet drama for me. I just do movie reviews. I just do angry movie reviews, and I scream into my camera. And sometimes it's funny, most of the time it's boring. And I've been going on for a long time now. But I have a lot to say. And now it's time for me to go to sleep. Good night, tubes.